Welcome to today's ABA webinar, There's a National Emergency at the Southern Border, True or False? My name is Angie abdul -Kader, and I'll be acting as the program's moderator. Today's webinar is hosted by the Section of Civil Rights and Social Justice, and it's sponsored by the Rights of Immigrants Committee. It's part of a six-part national lecture series with a new program on the third Wednesday of every month. Thank you for joining us today. This is, in fact, the fourth installment in our series, and we're excited to have a number of important co-sponsors, including the ABA Commission on Immigration, the ABA Criminal Justice Section, the ABA Center for Public Interest Law, the ABA Section of International Law, and the ABA Government and Public Section Lawyers Division. We appreciate all of their support. It's also important to highlight that none of this would be possible without the technical and logistical support of ABA staff. Thank you to Paula Shapiro and Ali Kilsgaard for all of your work to make these programs a success. To better understand the significance of this discussion, and it's important to take a step back to reflect how we arrived here. So I'm going to take a few moments to set the stage for our conversation today. The 2016 US presidential election results and Donald J. Trump's political ascension to the White House not only polarized the American public, but has also shaken the nation's democratic foundations. Specifically, President Trump's executive decisions, such as declaring a national emergency to fulfill a campaign promise to build a wall on the southern border, carry precedential value for executive power with largely negative implications for democratic governance and the rule of law. While seemingly enhancing the reach of his presidential authority, President Trump's actions have left many wondering about the constitutional limits of that power and its impact now and in the future on the separation of powers doctrine in the federal system. We all know that the Declaration of Independence, U.S. Constitution, and Bill of Rights are our country's foundational documents, responsible for outlining national values, principles, and laws. The balance of powers between the three branches of government and between the federal and state governments represents one of these foundational values. The Constitution specifically creates the three separate co-equal branches of federal government to guard against abuse of power by individuals or groups. By distributing the balance of power and providing for institutional checks, the framers of the Constitution sought to curb government abuses. This is known as the separation of powers doctrine. This particular webinar examines one of the many controversies with legal, political, and sometimes social contours involving the nature of executive power in the era of Trump, as well as its implications for the separation of powers doctrine in American democracy. Specifically, this program explores the president's declaration of a national emergency at the southern border last year in circumspection of congressional refusal to appropriate $5.8 billion to build the quote unquote law. Following his inauguration, you may recall, in pursuant to his promises on a presidential campaign trail, Trump issued an executive order making construction of a barrier wall across the southwest US border a federal priority. The wall could not be built unless Congress provided him with the funds. While Trump insisted on $5 billion to construct the barrier, House Democrats were only willing to give him $1.3 billion. 
During a negotiation process, the president repeatedly threatened to use emergency powers in order to pressure Congress into giving him what he wanted. After the House refused to do so, the president held a press conference in the Rose Garden, claiming a crisis at the border involving crime, drugs, and human trafficking. And despite evidence from the federal government showing otherwise, he declared a national emergency pursuant to the National Emergencies Act. By way of background, Congress passed the National Emergencies Act in 1976. The act permits the president to pronounce a national emergency when he considers it appropriate. It offers no specific definition of a quote unquote emergency, and in fact allows the president to declare one entirely at her discretion. Notably, almost all such past emergencies involve sanctions against foreign governments and groups for reasons such as human rights violations, rather than to spend money Congress intended for other purposes. By declaring a national emergency, the president avails herself of a dozen specialized laws. Some of these powers have funds the president otherwise could not access. For the declaration to southern border created a firestorm of controversy with many criticizing Trump as creating a quote unquote, quote unquote fake emergency in order to circumvent Congress and thereby undermining the separation of powers doctrine. As supporting evidence, they pointed to Trump's own words. At the time of last year's Rose Garden press conference, for instance, President Trump declared, quote, I didn't need to do this. I just wanted to do it faster. Members of the administration have also made public statements with negative implications. For instance, in an interview on Fox News Sunday, White House senior policy advisor Stephen Miller attempted to convince a national audience that the emergency is real. He argued that there is a, quote, increasing number of people crossing the southern border and a huge increase in drug death in the past decade. But when Fox News host Chris Wallace challenged his assertion with government statistics evidencing attempted crossings at their lowest levels in almost four decades and that most drugs actually arrive at ports of entry rather than the border, Miller responded, quote, you don't know what you don't know and you don't catch what you don't catch. But as a matter of national security, you can't have uncontrolled, unsecured areas of the border where people can pour in undetected, unquote. Fox News aside, the declaration has also engendered a rebuke from Congress. For example, Congress has since passed two joint resolutions to terminate the public emergency. Unsurprisingly, Trump vetoed those measures each time. It's interesting to note that a number of Republicans have in fact criticized the declaration because they see it as setting a potentially negative precedent for executive power, the separation of powers doctrine, as well as our democracy. In addition to the congressional rebuke, litigation ensued. For instance, a coalition of 16 states filed a federal lawsuit arguing that the president's decision to declare a national emergency is unconstitutional. Accusing the president of a quote, unconstitutional and unlawful scheme, the lawsuit says that states are trying to protect their residents, natural resources, and economic interests from President Donald J. Trump's flagrant disregard of fundamental separation of powers principles ingrained in the United States Constitution. In another lawsuit, groups argued that the president's actions threaten border communities, the environment, and a constitution separation of powers. And what some advocates are calling a temporary setback, the US Supreme Court has allowed construction of the border wall to proceed. In fact, one of our experts, Erica Newland, is with a group that is involved in that litigation and she'll be speaking about the progress of that lawsuit. To be sure, this controversy implicates the separation of powers doctrine as evidenced not only by the nature of the presidential action itself, but subsequent responses by other branches of government as well as the states. It also has implications for American democracy and the rule of law. And of course, it sets a precedent for executive power, not only in terms of future presidents, but also for this particular president, should the people elect him to a second term. Within a separation of powers framework, the constitutional contours, historical practices, and legal jurisprudence surrounding executive power is key to the border wall controversy. Article two of the US Constitution states, quote, the executive power shall be vested in a president, unquote. According to the stewardship theory or inherent powers approach to understanding executive powers, the president has all the powers listed in Article II, plus those additional powers needed to run the nation, regardless of whether the Constitution specifically authorizes it. Proponents of the stewardship theory argue that as a national leader, the president must be empowered to exercise personal judgments in conducting the nation's affairs to carry out Section 3 of Article 2, which empowers the president to, quote, take care that the laws be faithfully executed, she must have powers that go beyond those explicitly enumerated in the Constitution. So one way of understanding the stewardship theory 
or that of inherent powers approach to executive power is to think of a grade school teacher who's hired to teach the fourth grade. And her contract only says that she's supposed to instruct the students in her fourth grade class. So inherent in her, in those powers, is the idea that she can actually use a chalkboard, or she can use PowerPoint presentations, or she can instruct her students to engage in classroom activities or organize field trips. While none of that is explicitly stated in her contract, it's inherent to her power to actually instruct her class. But if the teacher shows up one day and tells all the students in the school, the first grade, the second grade, the second, third grade, and fourth and fifth grade, that they have to bring in $5 the next day for some cause that she favors, she would arguably be transcending the powers and the responsibility specifically set forth in her contract. Perhaps the principal has the authority to do that. Perhaps the school district has the authority to instruct all the kids in the school to bring in $5 to support a particular cause but that particular teacher doesn't. And that's one way of understanding executive power and the way it can transgress and interfere with the separation of powers doctrine. It's significant to note that the Supreme Court has traditionally supported the stewardship theory in both In Ray Nagel from 1890 and In Ray Debs, the case from 1895, the Supreme Court embraced the idea that the president is required to quote, take care that the laws be faithfully executed. And at the clause of best in the president implied powers beyond those expressly listed in the Constitution and independent of congressional statutes. Still, and this is important in the era of Trump, the executive is subject to congressional checks pursuant to the separation of powers doctrine. The Youngson case, commonly referred to as a steel mill seizure case from 1952, is instructive on this case. Legal scholars regarded as a leading Supreme Court decision addressing presidential power, and the concurring opinion of Justice Robert Jackson is particularly useful in this context. In Youngson Sheet and Tube Company versus Sawyer, the United States was at war in Korea when President Harry Truman ordered federal officials to seize and operate the nation's steel mills to avert a planned strike. Truman argued that the strike would interrupt steel production and disrupt the war effort, as well as the safety of our soldiers on the ground. Significantly, Truman had the option of using the Taft-Hartley Act, a federal statute passed by Congress, to obtain a court order prohibiting a strike for 80 days. During those 80 days, he could have then asked Congress for permission or emergency legislation. But politics prevented him from doing this. Specifically, Truman was a Democratic president, and the unions were an important component of his constituency. The unions despised the Taft-Hartley Act, which was enacted despite Truman's veto. Set against this political backdrop, Truman claimed presidential power pursuant to the U.S. Constitution to seize its steel mills and have the federal government run them, rather than resort to using the Taft-Hartley Act. To do so, Truman cited his powers as commander-in-chief in Article II, allowing the president to, quote, take care that the laws be faithfully executed, investing him with executive powers. In response, the steel mill owners sued, challenging the constitutionality of the president's action. Significantly, the Supreme Court rejected Truman's arguments. It found that none of the provisions that he cited authorized the president to nationalize the steel mills. The decision included both the majority and concurring opinion. And while they both advanced the same result, they introduced two distinct approaches to understanding presidential power relevant in this context. First, Justice Hugo Black wrote for the majority and which would be understood as the formalist approach to executive power. The majority reason that the steel mills were too far from the battlefield to trigger the commander in chief powers. The take care power and executive power both limited the president to executing laws that Congress had enacted. Here, the president's seizure of the mills in absence of any corresponding legislation from Congress was too similar to lawmaking, which was Congress's purview, rather than the law executing responsibility that belongs to the executive. Truman's nationalization of the mills was unconstitutional because it violated a bright categorical divide between the formal powers given to Congress and that of the executive. In contrast, Justice Jackson, in his concurring opinion, introduced a functionalist approach, whereby president's powers are not rigidly fixed under the Constitution, but adjustable. According to functionalism, the lines separating the three branches of government are blurry and subject to ebbs and flows. Such variances are permissible as long as each branch retains its core functions and has capacity to check and balance the others. Significantly, Justice Jackson described the three zones of presidential power that prove relevant to understanding the executive actions that are subject of the instant inquiry. First, executive power is strongest, Justice Jackson explained, when Congress authorizes the president to act. 
In this instance, the court should defer to the politically accountable branches of government. Next, executive power is weakest when Congress has acted to curb presidential authority. Last, Justice Jackson spoke of a quote, zone of twilight, the space between congressionally authorized and congressionally forbidden assertions of executive authority. Regarding President Truman's seizure of the steel mills, Justice Jackson reasoned that it would have been constitutional if no practical alternative existed. However, he could have availed himself of such an alternative. President Truman could have used the Taft-Hartley Act to secure an injunction barring a strike for 80 days and then asked Congress for emergency legislation to authorize the seizure of the steel mills. Justice Jackson further explained that the Taft-Hartley Act tacitly acknowledged that Congress did not intend the president to unilaterally coordinate federal takeovers of entire industries. Justice Jackson's framework for understanding presidential authority is useful in analyzing the border wall controversy, the subject of this webinar. For instance, in this case, the administration claims to be acting pursuant to congressional authority found in the Emergency Powers Act. To that end, the statute is analogous to the Taft-Hartley Act that President Truman chose to ignore. Still, critics of the president's declaration of a national emergency cite to its pretextual nature. As evidence, they point not only to the declaration's timing, President Trump, after all, claimed a public emergency only after Congress denied him funding, but critics also point to the president's own words. Specifically, Trump stated during last year's press conference in the Rose Garden that he did not have to declare an emergency at all, but chose to do so in order to accelerate the process. Further, while the administration claims to have declared the emergency pursuant to statutory authority, it is clear that Congress rejected the president's request for additional funding. In fact, on two separate occasions, Congress has attempted to terminate the national emergency by joint resolution only to have the president veto their efforts. Keeping Justice Jackson's framework in mind, has the president acted with or without congressional approval? Is that approval signified by virtue of statutory authority granted vis-a-vis -vis the Emergency Powers Act? Or is Congress's disapproval signified by virtue of denying the president the funding that he wanted for his wall? Not to mention two distinct congressional resolutions to terminate the public emergency the president declared. Regarding the Emergency Powers Act, is it time for legislative reform to curb potential executive abuses from happening again in the future? To help us grapple with some of these questions, there's not necessarily a race here. We're joined by a spectrum of experts for what is certain to be an enlightening discussion. First up is Erica Newland. Erica most recently served as an attorney advisor at the Office of Legal Counsel in the Department of Justice. Before joining DOJ, she served as a law clerk to the Honorable Merrick B. Garland of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit and as a senior policy analyst at the Center for Democracy and Technology. During law school, Erica worked for the National Security Division at DOJ, as well as the Senate Judiciary Committee. Significantly, Erica received her JD from Yale Law School. Welcome, Erica. Hi, um, I am going to pull up this PowerPoint presentation to talk a little bit about um, some of the stuff that NG has already hit. I'll try not to be too repetitive. Um, and then Protect Democracy's lawsuit at the, um, uh, against the president's proclamation. So let me try to share my screen here. Um, all right, I think that is, can the other presenters who I can see give me a thumbs up that that's good? Okay, great. Um, and I will put the slideshow on view show. And now I will just talk to a screen and hope that you all can hear and see me. Um, uh, and thank you, Angie, for that for that introduction. Uh, so I want to, um, before talking specifically about our lawsuit, I want to go back over just a little bit of the recent history around this. Um, and again, I'll try not to be too repetitive, but but do want to emphasize some points of context here. Um, and and the place to, the place where we began is that Congress has the exclusive power under the Constitution to decide how the government spends money. That's through the Appropriations Clause and the Spending Clause. And I will say that when um, the national emergency, when, when the president started talking about the possibility of declaring a national emergency back in, um, back in the, I guess, January of 2019, we, and I think a lot of others thought, oh no, he is, he's about to kind of open up this, this new, 
uh, this new route for abusing presidential authority. Obviously, there have been national emergencies declared ever since the um, act, um, the National Emergency Act was enacted in 1976. But um, we thought this was going to be the first of many of these like really, really um, tenuous, uh, tenuous. Um, national emergency declarations. And perhaps so, but with the hindsight of a year, one thing that I know I've been giving a lot of thought to is that actually this there this was the beginning of a lot of abuses of the appropriations power. Um, both the spending of unappropriated funds and the impoundment of um, impoundment of funds that, that have been appropriated. Uh, Ukraine is a great example of that. There are plenty of others. Um, so I think that is a really just helpful frame um, for looking back over the past year and how we can connect what happened uh, with the national emergency declaration at the southern border with broader trends in um, in recent governance. Uh, so, of course, as NG said, you know, the president back in December of 2018 asks Congress to authorize and appropriate certain funding for the border. Um, and the fight over this prompts the lar longest government shutdown in U.S. history. As someone who lives in D.C., I had a lot of um, friends and former colleagues who, of course, were not getting paid and for whom um, for whom this was a period of real hardship. So, uh, sorry, having some PowerPoint issues here. Uh, so, in um, in January, uh, as the shutdown you know drags on uh, past the holidays, uh, Trump starts making some noise. If Congress doesn't give him the border wall funding, he's going to invoke the National Emergencies Act and declare a national emergency. And um, you know what, he's using this as a negotiation tactic, basically which of course raises the question, as Angie talked about, whether this is a real emergency, if it is the type of thing that um, you know, Congress actually has, uh, has the time and clearly the interest in engaging on one way or the other. Uh, the National Emergencies Act, which was um, one of the post-Nixon reforms, it was enacted in 1976, um, states that during the period of a national emergency, which is an undefined term, uh, the president is delegated the authority to declare a national emergency, to invoke special powers that are only available once that national emergency has been declared, um, and that Congress retains the authority to, um, to terminate that emergency. So this is a constrained delegation of authority. And I will talk later on, and I know Seth will too, about Congress's role in this space. Um, it's important to recognize that when the NEA was enacted, it was an act, it was designed to actually curtail the president's power to declare an emergency. It ended a lot of emergencies that had been declared it, decades ago, um, at the very beginning of some, as early as the very beginning of the 20th century. Um, and, you know, was designed to, the legislative history makes it very clear, was designed to limit uh, the declaration of national emergencies to times when the emergency was unforeseen, right? When Congress, as a body that might be in recess, uh, or that takes a while to reach consensus, wouldn't be able to come to consensus. Um, this, this is a stopgap measure. Um, but of course, Congress was, was engaging very actively on the question of border security. And, um, and nonetheless, Trump was, um, was threatening a declaration of a national emergency. And you can see the quote here, uh, you know, we can call a national emergency because of the security of our country. Absolutely. No, we can do it. I haven't done it. I may do it. I may do it. But we could call a national emergency and build the wall very quickly. Um, it's another way of doing it. But if we can do it through a negotiated process, we're giving that a shot. So he's saying we have time. This is this is what I'm going to do if I don't get my way. Um, so a deal is finally reached in the shutdown. Government workers go back to work, start getting paychecks again, um, and Congress enacts and Trump signs the 2019 Consolidated Appropriations Act. Um, as NG said, this act includes $1.375 billion in funding for fencing in specific locations along the southern border. So this isn't a generic grant, do whatever you want with this money along the border. This is specific types of fencing in specific places. Um, Trump signs it into law, and the same day, as Andy said, that he signs it into law, he goes out into the Rose Garden and um, gives a speech in which he declares a national emergency um, because he didn't get all of the money that he wanted. And um, I, uh, I used to, as, as Andy said, I used to work at OLC. Part of what we did there at the Office of Legal Counsel at the Department of Justice, part of what we did there was um, review proclamations and executive orders um, from the president. Uh, obviously, I wasn't involved in this one. Um, but so I always think about not only what the president was, uh, how the president was justifying a declaration of a national emergency, but, but how the lawyers were as well. 
and um, and what you see here is an uh, invocation of the humanitarian crisis at the border. Um, I think it's worth asking, you know, a humanitarian crisis of who's making. Um, there, are, I think very few people would dispute that there are a lot of crises at the border, but um, a lot of that is is uh, of the making of this administration, which is not um, uh, of the making of this administration. Um, you see, uh, as Ng was talking about, uh, invocation of you know, major entry point for criminals, gang members, and narcotics. Um, and you see this kind of strange balancing between, on the one hand, the, an acknowledgement that uh, you know, there are long-standing debates over how porous our borders should be, and uh, on the other hand, an effort to say the situation has worsened in certain respects in recent years to try to make the emergency sound um, plausible. Uh, and uh, then uh, a statement that it is necessary for the armed forces to provide additional support to address the cri crisis and a uh, declaration of the national emergency uh, that follows from that. Of course, this, uh, this invocation of the necessity of having the armed forces is at odds with what the president then ad-libbed in, the, um, in the Rose Garden, where he said, I didn't need to do this, um, but I'd rather do it much faster. Uh, it seems like the emergency was um, Trump's uh, inability to, to persuade Congress to let him get his way. Um, so what did the proclamation do? So the president's proclamation declaring the emergency um, and an accompanying White House statement um, uh, sought lay claim to $6.7 billion that Congress had not appropriated for the purposes of building various forms of border security um, that Congress did not authorize. Um, there are basically three different, um, three different funds that uh, the declaration and the accompanying White House statement sought to, um, sought to uh, get access to. So the first, 10 U.S.C. 2808, um, is a statute that says when the president declares a national emergency, one that requires the use of the armed forces, that goes back to that kind of uh, statement by the president that use of the armed forces was necessary. Um, the Secretary of Defense may undertake military construction process projects necessary to support such use of the armed forces. Um, military construction is defined pretty narrowly here and involves things that must be under the jurisdiction of the Secretary of the Military Department. Historically, this provision has been used um, with respect to, for example, barracks and runways in Afghanistan and courthouse security at the U.S. Naval Base at Guantanamo Bay. So indisputably military um, projects. Obviously, that's, um, that's not what was happening here. Um, second, uh, the White House statement invoked uh, 10 U.S.C. Section 284, um, which is a um, DOD pot of money for um, fighting uh, for drug interdiction activities, um, and it permits uh, money to be used for small scale construction projects. Um, and, uh, and again, saying that there were unforeseen military requirements here, uh, the government laid claim to laid claim to this money that had been appropriated for other purposes, and then finally laid claim to the Treasury Department's asset fortune, forfeiture funds. So um, a bunch of folks sued. Um, uh, I don't want to. I want to just talk about two of the lawsuits. Um, one was brought by Protect Democracy, my organization, and um, and another was brought by the ACLU. Um, and these are two that have a lot of activity around them right now. So looking at the ACLU one first. Um, ACLU filed this lawsuit on behalf of the Sierra Club and the Southern Borders Communities Coalition. They filed it in the Northern District of California, um, and they've gotten uh, a, um, a you know, uh, it had a positive outcome in the district court, um, which held that the government's use of military construction funds under Section 2808. Um, so going back mm -hmm. for a second, if I can, um, this is that section about required for projects that require the use of the armed forces. Um, the Secretary of Defense may undertake military construction process projects as necessary to support such use of the armed forces. Um, the the judge found that you know the the plain reality, as he said in this case, um, uh, is that the border barrier projects are uh, are not necessary to support the use of the armed forces. Um, Congress can't appropriate these funds, and so um, the use of them is unlawful. Uh, court issued a permanent injunction, which has been stayed pending appeal. Um, appeal is, is ongoing, and as the government has sought access to additional funds, the ACLU has sought review of those as well. 
Um, my organization, Protect Democracy, um, joined by both right and left-leaning lawyers, this is very much a bipartisan effort, uh, filed a lawsuit in the Western District of Texas, so down at the border, on behalf of the County of El Paso and the Border Network for Human Rights. Uh, the Border Network for Human Rights is a nonprofit organization um, uh, that works along the border with, with border communities. And um, I would really encourage you to um, check out the website that we've set up. Um, you know, information about our lawsuit is uh, is here in this first link. Um, but second link in the emergency.org talks some about the um, uh, has some local features, some local voices from the border, talking about some of the ways that the declaration of the emergency um, harmed the communities by making uh, their communities seem dangerous when they are not, by making uh, members of their community seem dangerous when they are not. Um, and, you know, this was, um, you know, well, this is not an element of our case. I, uh, you know, will, will point out that um, when things like the shooting that happened down in El Paso um, uh, take place and um, the perpetrator of the violence says that, you know, he was motivated by, um, uh, by hatred against um, people coming across the border. Um, you know, th those can be, you know, maybe uh, sometimes it's hard to directly draw lines, but what we see here is a sanctioning of the types of rhetoric that is um, that is sanctioning by the government with things like this, uh, proclamations like this of the types of rhetoric um, that is is resulting in um, in mass murder. Um, the, the stakes are are very real in 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 very very serious ways. So. Um, so moving on to the claims in our lawsuit, um, we, we have argued that the proclamation violates the National Emergencies Act because there was not a real emergency. So the president did not have uh, the authority to declare one. Um, Congress only delegated the authority to uh, declare an emergency in a period of an emergency. There is no emergency here. So the president is acting in violation of, of the act. Um, second, um, we've argued that um, as cons when the proclamation or the government has construed this act so broadly that the term emergency is devoid of all meaning, that interpretation violates the non-delegation doctrine um, uh, because it suggests that what Congress has done is delegate to the president a, um, a completely unbounded authority. We've argued that um, the use of these funds violates the Administrative Procedure Act because uh, because the use is not in accordance with law, um, and of course it violates the aforementioned statutes as well. Um, and we've also argued that the funding plan violates the Consolidated Appropriations Act, which put limits on when funds can be reprogrammed and transferred. And what um, what the government has done here is not consistent with those limits. And and that's what you see the um, you see the district court in California saying. Um, and then uh, also some of the same arguments about the transfer of funds. Um, and then finally, our, we argue that the proclamation violates the president's duty to faithfully execute the law under the take care clause. Um, you know, faithful execution is um, execution in good faith, trying your best to make sure that um, that you are um, that you are honestly and accurately um, executing the law. And when the president said, I didn't need to do this, and then issues a proclamation that says this is necessary, um, that shows a, um, a violation of that constitutional obligation. Uh, so the outcome so far, as you all know, litigation just takes a really long time. Um, uh, in October, uh, Judge Briones in the Western District of Texas held that the proclamation is unlawful because the funding plan violates the Consolidated Appropriations Act. Um, that's that section 739, which um, describes when uh, when transferring transferring reprogramming of funds can occur, uh, expressly forbids the government's funding a plan. And the court did not reach the other claims or the constitutional claims. Um, the court issues a nation, na nationwide injunction. Um, the Fifth Circuit has granted the government's motion to stay the injunction um, and a pending appeal. Um, so that's that's where that um, excuse me. Uh, that's where that stands. Um, meanwhile, uh, things have been moving on the Hill. So uh, the, um, as NG mentioned, the National Emergencies Act of 1976 uh, allowed Congress, gave Congress some um, power beyond kind of its normal power, of course, to legislate, uh, to, um, to terminate a national emergency. And it included two innovations, which were kind of innovations of that era. 
Um, you also see them in the War Powers um, Act and in the um, Armed Export Control Act, um, two other places I'm aware of them being. Um, and they were innovations to kind of keep Congress involved in the president's decision to declare an emergency. So if Congress was going to delegate this authority, it wanted to retain some authority for itself to oversee how this, how that power was delegated. Um, originally, back in 1976, the NEA empowered Congress to override a declaration of a national emergency with a mere concurrent resolution to terminate. So that means majority of the House, majority of the Senate, no presidential signature necessary. Um, uh, of course, those of you who have been trained in the law since 1983 will have lots of um, lots of alarm bells going off in your head because INS versus Chadha Supreme Court case declared resolutions like this unconstitutional uh, for uh, outside of things like um, like uh, treaty like the Senate's uh, right to uh, um, rights related to treaties and you know the nominate the uh, you know, nomination confirmation process um anything that congress does has to then uh get the be presented to the president um and get the president's signature or or um have a veto override so a result of the amendments to this act that followed INS v. Chadha is that Congress now can't just deploy a concurrent resolution to terminate an emergency. They need a veto-proof majority to terminate an emergency. So they gave away this authority initially thinking, okay, we can claw it back with just you know majorities in each chamber. That's no longer the case. The second thing um, that the second innovation uh, in the National Emergencies Act are expedited procedures, and these still matter. Um, and these are expedited procedures to ensure that termination votes actually make it to the floor, that the majority leader um, can't hold them up. Uh, and under the National Emergencies Act, expedited termination votes are in order, so those those termination votes can come to the floor every six months for the duration of the emergency. Um, so this has meant that termination resolutions, even ones that Mitch McConnell doesn't support in the Senate, for example, um, have come to the floor. Um, and the vote, as Angie mentioned, has been relatively bipartisan, um, more bipartisan than just about anything else we've seen over the past three years, three and a half years. Um, you can see the numbers here. Um, uh, you know, 12 Senate Republicans in March 2019, 11 um, in September 2019. Um, at the 12th, I forget who it was, they weren't present that day. We actually didn't lose any votes um, on support for termination. It just had to do with, with who was present and who was not. Um, ditto, ditto on the dim side. You had a lot of folks out, you know, uh, campaigning for president and stuff during the, uh, during the votes. Um, and it's interesting that all of Trump's vetoes, there have been six of them, have come in response to votes on statutes that pre chata would have allowed one or both houses of Congress to rescind a delegation of authority to the president. So I think Seth is probably gonna talk about this more, but that's the Yemen war powers resolution, arms sales disapprovals, and, uh, the, and these two national emergency termination votes. It's kind of a really interesting, um, really interesting to see what seems to get some bipartisan interest, even if it's not enough to, to overcome a veto. Um, so, uh, recognizing that uh, in light of the way that the National Emergencies Act has had to change with changing Supreme Court case law, um, there have been efforts to, um, ref to create reform and to change the delegation of authority to the president so that Congress can have more of a say. Um, in July 2019, the Article One Act, S-784, was reported out of committee um, with an overwhelming bipartisan majority, 11 to 2. Um, and this would this act would amend the National Emergencies Act with what we call a sunset and approve mechanism. So basically, a national emergency would sunset within 30 days, consistent with the idea of you know this is a stopgap measure that um, that the president is taking, while so Congress can then have time to decide whether or not to um, whether or not to approve it. Um, any national emergency uh, that Congress did approve, if it chose to approve. Um, within that sunset period would require annual reapproval. Um, if Congress did not approve the national emergency, the president couldn't just issue a new one every 30 days. Um, and expedited procedures would ensure that a resolution to approve the national emergency would get to the chamber floor for a vote. Uh, because we we do recognize that there's there's this issue where where a majority leader can can hold up progress. Um, the bill has 18 Republican co-sponsors, uh, which is pretty incredible. Um, and you know this, we think this the sense basic sunset mechanism would work for lots of other laws gutted by Chada, War Powers Act, Arms Export Control Act. You see it um, in some trade acts as well um, that are making their way um, through Congress. And so finally, um, I want to just kind of take a step back and look at where we are one year later. 
litigation, of course, is um, is continuing. Uh, we'll see where that goes. Um, you know, the emergency has been renewed. Uh, as I said at the front, um, unlawful fund raids are continuing. Um, you know, the uh, administration sought to divert $3.8 billion from weapons programs recently, move those into the drug interdiction funds, and then move that into border wall funding. Um, and the ACLU has um, is, is seeking review of that um, as part of their case in the Northern District of California. And then, as I said you, before, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of abuse of the appropriations power. And this is something that my organization is really keeping an eye on right now. You know, in the first half of this administration, there was a lot of talk about the administration administration undermining rule of law by undermining judicial orders, um, you know, uh, Andrew Jackson style, um, now let Chief Justice Marshall enforce it. And, you know, we haven't seen a lot of that. Instead, what it seems to be is that Congress is being ignored, um, and then the courts either aren't stepping in or, of course, are very slow in doing so. Um, and the kind of abuse of, abuse of the appropriate, uh, I wouldn't say abuse of the appropriations power because the president doesn't actually have that power. Abuse of appropriated funds is the site for, for where we're seeing that happen. Um, and, um, and so that's something to keep an eye on as, um, as we go through this year. And of course, legislative reform efforts um, continue because this should be a bipartisan issue. Um, one about, as Angie said, keeping the separation of powers um, and checks and balances in place. And so with that, um, I will turn off my screen and hand it over to Seth. Thank you. And I guess I should say, I see that um, Angie has asked how we can get a hold of the PowerPoint. I think that will distri be distributed to folks um, later. All right, thank you so much, Erica. Um, I apologize, I was on mute. Uh, we will open the Discussion up for Q&A at the conclusion of all three presentations. Um, so we're going to hear next from Seth and then after that from Laura. I do want to highlight for our attendees um, that on the right hand side of your screen, there should be a control panel that allows you to actually pose questions. You're able to just type in your questions right into the screen. Um, and then each of our speakers, uh, in, as well as myself as moderator, uh, will see your questions and, and will pose those questions during the Q&A that will uh, ensue after each of the presentations. So um, thank you again, Erica, for that wonderful presentation. We're looking forward to following up on some of the points that you made uh, during the Q&A session. Next is Seth. Weinberger, who is Professor of Politics and Government at the University of Puget Sound. He received his BA in Political Philosophy from the University of Chicago, an MA in Security Studies from Georgetown University, and an MA and PhD in Political Science from Duke University. He teaches courses on international relations, U.S. foreign policy, international security, terrorism, constitutional law, and political philosophy. His book, Restoring the Balance, War Powers, and an Age of Terror was published by Prager Press in 2009. His recently published articles include Enemies Among Us, a targeted killing of American members of Al-Qaeda and a need for congressional leadership in the Georgetown Global Security Studies Review, and Institutional Signals, the political dimension of international competition, law harmonization with Jeffrey Mann, and the Antitrust Bulletin. His current research focuses on a decentralization structures of modern day extremist groups with a particular focus on US-based organizations. In 2011, as well as 2016, Professor Weinberger received the Thomas A. Davis Teaching Excellence Award. We're very excited to have uh, Dr. Weinberger with us. Welcome, Seth, to the panel. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate it, and I'm very happy to uh, to be here. Um, as a political scientist and not a lawyer, uh, it means I tend to focus more on uh, the role of power and governance. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the broader political implications of the National Emergency Act and of President Trump's declaration of emergency, as well as some other uh, actions. So th the webinar itself is entitled, Is There an Emergency at the Southern Border? true or false? And uh, I think the answer is actually simultaneously that it is both true and false. So I, I actually sort of uh, refer to it as Schrodinger's emergency. Uh, in the world of reality, no, there isn't an emergency. Uh, and I think Erica did an excellent job of explaining that there wasn't a crisis, that the administration knows there isn't a crisis, um, and that there still isn't a crisis. So um, 
But in the world of politics, there is an emergency because the president has said there's an emergency. Uh, the Declaration uh, Proclamation 9844, pursuant to the National Emergency Act, declared that there is a national emergency uh, on the southern border of the United States. And so this sort of creates uh, a really interesting political problem uh, that while in the real world, the emergency, or maybe I guess the lack thereof, matters in the lives of people crossing the border, there's actually a different dimension to this, which is the political emergency that I, Erica laid out some of, uh, the way in which it actually threatens both our constitutional scheme of sharing and balancing powers amongst and between the branches of government, uh, but also really affects the lives of vulnerable populations and not necessarily just those who might be uh, crossing the border. But as I, will sh as I will argue, I think, poses broader problems for the way in which governance occurs and also poses particular threats to vulnerable or marginalized um, populations. Um, to answer the question that NG raised in her introduction, I would argue that yeah, the president is acting at least uh, sort of strictly pursuant to congressional legislation. The problem is that Congress, in its infinite wisdom, seems to repeatedly choose to give the president in multiple ways, some of which I'll talk about later, nearly unfettered power without giving itself a way to get that power back. Um, and that, I think, puts us in the problem that we're in. So the Constitution, and uh, Angie again addressed a little bit of this in her introduction, sets out the process, uh, the legislative process, which the National Emergency Act threatens to subvert. Uh, the NEA allows the president to assume legislative powers that affect the legal status and rights of individuals, American citizens and non-citizens, but doesn't have a meaningful way for Congress to block problematic presidential actions or even more importantly, pull that emergency grant of power back uh, and doesn't, um, doesn't really have a meaningful check, any kind of thing that replicates the structural checks and balances that are built into our system of government in the Constitution. So the declaration of emergency allows for the activation of multiple statutes and powers as Erica set, set out. Uh, since its passage, there have been 59 emergencies declared by presidents. 32 of these emergencies are actually still active. Now, I think it's safe to say of those 59 emergencies, only three of them actually are anything that you would actually call an emergency. Two of them were responses to the attacks of September 11th, and then one was in 2009 that relaxed uh, various regulations to allow hospitals to address the what was then the swine flu epidemic. So these were regulations that prevented them from using certain medicines or testing certain things, and so the, the emergency was declared to allow for those regulations to be lifted. So in my estimation, you have 56 emergencies uh, that are not emergencies, uh, and many of these are still active. But Congress has not objected to any of these until this current one. Not only that, but Congress has um, until now refused to engage even in its legally mandated oversight. So the state of emergency lasts 12 months unless the president renews it. And as uh, Erica pointed out, Congress is legally required, not just allowed, but required to meet every six months to consider, um, to consider whether or not that should be, the emergency should be terminated. So that leaves 1,100 reviews that should have occurred over those 59 emergencies. Congress has only met, eh, depending two or three times if you include the war power stuff, twice or three times out of 1,100 reviews. So here's the fundamental problem, right? Which is that Congress is willing, and I'll talk about why I think it's willing to do this, it's willing to basically hand over to the president these expanded powers that it either then doesn't care about or that it doesn't give itself and, excuse me, instead of or, and that it doesn't give itself the ability to pull back. Now, most of these declarations of emergency were innocuous, at least as we would think about it from a domestic standpoint. They were usually things that allowed the president to sanction foreign individuals who had been associated with acts of terror or drug smuggling. Uh, so an individual is is suspected of being uh, of bringing drugs in the United States or suspected of acts of terrorism, and this would allow the president to freeze that person's asset or to put sanctions on them. And so those were most of the emergencies were. So while they weren't maybe justified as emergencies, it's hard to imagine the president needed expanded power or that the timeliness was that important that the president couldn't have asked Congress to do this. The president would declare an emergency, and Congress didn't object to any of these presumably because the president was not using the powers that the emergency gave to the president uh, 
uh, domestically, was only applying them to foreign individuals. Uh, so this lack of concern from Congress over this period since 1983, um, well, really since the beginning of the National Emergency Act, really obscured what was the real fundamental problem that we can now see pretty clearly, which is that the only thing preventing the problem from abusing the, excuse me, the only thing preventing the president from abusing the National Emergency Act and using those emergency powers domestically in ways that might be problematic was really precedent, right? There was really no meaningful check because Congress was not interested. And even if it had been interested, it wasn't clear what it could do. Uh, as Erica pointed out, the original National Emergency Act had what's called a legislative veto. Congress could use a concurrent resolution. So simple majorities in, how, in both houses not sent to the president as a law. Uh, a concurrent resolution could end the emergency, but INS v. Chadha in 1983 ends the legislative veto, which now requires joint resolutions, which have to be presented to the president and to be vetoed. Well, this is not really a meaningful check. In the history of the country, only 4.3 vetoes have been overruled. Uh, and concerning the current emergency, the House uh, of Representatives voted 245 to 182 to overturn the declaration of national emergency. The Senate agreed with the House in a vote of 59 to 41. Neither of those majorities are really, I would say, close to the two thirds that you would need to override the veto, which of course uh, was then uh, vetoed, Trump did issue the veto. So when the legislative veto, this ability of Congress to block um, presidential action through simple majorities rather than um, super majorities that would be needed to overturn the veto, when Chadha ends that, um, Justice White at the time issued a very prescient dissent. And he, he said this, without the legislative veto, Congress is faced with a Hobson's choice, either to refrain from delegating the necessary authority, leaving itself with the helpless task of writing laws with the requisite specificity to cover endless special circumstances across the entire policy landscape, or in the alternative, to advocate its lawmaking function to the executive branch and independent agencies. To choose the former leaves major national problems unresolved, to opt for the latter risks unaccountable policymaking by those not elected to fill that role. Unfortunately, I think as we see now, Congress often has chosen that second option to delegate power to the president uh, and to abdicate its lawmaking functions. Now, interestingly, the legislative veto actually has continued. There have been more than 400 of them, according to scholar Louis Fisher, who, uh, who writes about this. Uh, since the Chadha decision said you can't use legislative vetoes, in fact, Congress continues to use them. And I can talk a little bit more about that in Q&A if anyone is interested in knowing about that. But unfortunately, the mechanisms that allow for legislative vetoes to persist aren't really functional or wouldn't really be applicable in things like the National Emergency uh, Act. And so this has left Congress with this fundamental problem. Either you don't allow um, the emergency powers at all, which if there were to be a real emergency, of course, would then hamstring the president. If there were a situation in which you actually needed emergency powers and it didn't exist, then the president can't take the kind of swift and decisive and vigorous action necessary to protect the country. So the, the pres, uh, Congress, excuse me, has chosen the second of White's options to abdicate its legislative responsibilities, to give this power to the president without a way of getting it back. And again, up until now, hasn't paid attention as presidents have abused this repeatedly using emergencies and non-emergency situations, getting us to where we are now. Now, the danger, as I see it, is that this really threatens to subvert uh, the constitutional structures of separation, separating and balancing the powers of the branches of government. And I think that the potential lurks for even worse abuses, particularly against vulnerable, marginalized populations, those populations who have already been targeted by many of the administration's current policies. So for example, the declaration of, of national emergency allows for the activation of the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, or EPA, or IEPA. I'm not sure how you would actually pronounce that, but let's go with EPA. Um, all but two of the existing emergencies of those, what are the 39 that are active, or uh, sorry, 32 that are active, all but two of those uh, extant emergencies are largely under the EPA. Uh, the EPA allows the president to respond to unusual and extraordinary threats that has its source in whole or substantial part outside the United States. Declaring something to be a threat under EPA allows the president to freeze assets, block financial transactions, right? So again, most of these emergencies, which are trying to put financial sanctions on individuals, uh, are using EPA. Uh, 
Um, so during what we might call the global war on terror, both President Bush and Obama used these powers under EPA and the national emergency that resulted from September 11th uh, to designate U.S.-based charities and individuals as being suspected of providing material support to terrorists. Uh, the executive order that President Bush ordered that allowed this only requires that there is a reasonable basis. Uh, and this then allowed several U.S.-based Islamic charities to have their assets frozen without any kind of due process. And in a particularly, I would say, horrifying story, a Somali-American named Garad Jama was designated as being uh, involved providing material support to terrorism. Uh, he lost his business. He had his bank account frozen. He had to sue the government to be allowed to get a job as a grocery store cashier in order to pay his bills. By the time the government admitted that his designation was an error and unfroze his bank accounts, his business had collapsed. Right. So uh, declaring emergencies activates these kinds of things that allow for this kind of targeting at that sort of level. Uh, so the breakdown of the process and this transfer of legislative power that occurs under declarations of emergencies. Uh, threatens wider abuses. So things that we have seen occurring under emergencies, some, uh, for example, the internment of 100,000 Japanese Americans during World War II, many of whom attended the university at which I now teach, and we're remembering that uh, right now uh, on my campus, uh, was, was pursuant to an, an emergency, right? uh, obviously war powers that the president assumed with the declaration of war in World War II, not the National Emergency Act. But if we think just about some of the recent actions that we're seeing going on right now, uh, the targeting of Iranian Americans who were uh, who were detained crossing borders when they were trying to return home after the Solem the assassination of, uh, of the Iranian uh, General Soleimani, um, right? People were detained and harassed and 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 targeted for extreme scrutiny, or the recent announcement that uh, the president is going to be sending tactical uh, units. SWAT teams associated with the Immigrations and Customs Enforcement, the, uh, these BORTAC units that are going to be sent to Chicago and sanctuary cities, not to do anything pursuant to that would require a SWAT unit, but simply to support the regular run of the mill, that's a quote from the New York Times, immigration effect, right? So the president is actually militarizing uh, standard in immigration enforcement using SWAT units to carry out what should be normal routine kinds of uh, of, um, of operations. Uh, on the other side, of course, in response to the president's declaration of emergency for the wall, Democratic presidential candidates are discussing their own uses of emergency powers to deal with climate change, for example. So use of EPA, a declaration of a national climate emergency, for example, could allow for the seizures of oil refineries or the banning of import and export of oil. Uh, which could, of course, impose massive financial costs, especially on those least able to afford and to adapt. Uh, so, yeah, these all might be hypothetical, right? These, the, the, those things that I mentioned aren't occurring yet under emergencies. But the time to address problems is before problems occur, right? So the fact that this emergency act exists and allows for the activation of these kinds of powers creates the possibility that they will be used in these ways, ways that we're already seeing the president starting to experiment with other sorts of powers. Uh, and of course, as I mentioned, Congress really doesn't have the ability to get that power back uh, and to, uh, or to, or to do anything about it, right? Um, so Congress is supposed to be, or it is, the most representative and deliberative body of government. It's supposed to represent all the varied interests in the nation and balance those interests against one another. Of course, sometimes in achieving one policy objective, another group is harmed or uh, uh, gets some sort of detrimental outcome. Uh, but at a minimum, the deliberative process of legislation ensures that the losers are at least represented in the process by which they're disadvantaged and at least have an opportunity for compensation and compromise through some kind of law growing process. Right? Uh, so that is at least what's supposed to occur as we make policy through a representative process. Interests are considered, interests are balanced, and the process of building a, a winning coalition requires trading off um, you know, a policy here to compensate someone for being harmed there. Um, in its attempt to expedite governance in the complex world that we live in, Congress wants to delegate authority to the president because as Justice White suggested in his dissent, it can't figure out how to legislate for every possible uh, eventuality or outcome. So the NEA rests on the premise that there might be an emergency that requires an immediate and vigorous response uh, with unfettered executive power. But I think that Congress has made one of two and maybe both uh, uh, of these mistakes. 
One, forgetting that the power you give to the president that you like will eventually belong to the president that you don't like, right? And so when you allow your president to do something, uh, eventually the other president, your, uh, their president is gonna do similar things. And I think the other mistake that Congress might have made is the assumption that presidents will in fact be rational actors who will use their power in the best interest of the country and in line with existing norms and precedents. Um, and so I just wanna point out one more thing. It's not actually connected to the National Emergency Act, but it's consonant with this argument that I'm making. So Slate ran an arg article yesterday ab uh, about the real ID law. This has been a problem for a little while, um, but it just was brought to a lot of people's attention yesterday. The real ID law, which is a law about state identifications, um, identification cards and the requirements to get a driver's license and things like this, also contained a clause that said the Secretary of Homeland Security shall have the authority to waive all legal requirements that she determines necessary to ensure expeditious construction of a border wall literally right it is a law that says the secretary of homeland security can waive state local and federal law any of them as long as she thinks it's necessary to ensure the construction of a border wall so right now there are at least 50 laws that are being waived the endangered species act the clean water act the solid waste disposal act the native american grace and repatriation act right the president is just wiping all these things away in order to build the wall and congress has acquiesced in this wrote it into a law and now can't get that back. Uh, in Federalist Paper 10, uh, Alexander Hamilton wrote about the problem of factions. And he defined a faction as a number of citizens, whether amounting to a majority or a minority of the whole, who are united and actuated by a common impulse of passion or of interest that are adverse to the rights of other citizens and the permanent and aggregate interests of the community. Their solution to the problem of factions was divided government, not just separate branches, but specifically within the branch. Right. So in Federalist 10, he talks about the, the need for the House and the Senate to force the to, to check Congress's own uh, interest uh, and own impulses to act adverse to the permanent and aggregate interest. Uh, and what we've seen is that as the competency of the administrative state has grown and the scope of the administrative has, uh, state has grown and as Congress has become increasingly polarized and deadlocked, Presidents are increasingly governing by executive order and Congress is increasingly willing to allow it to do so without the ability to get that power back. So what's the solution to this? Well, first Congress has to stop delegating its legislative authority. Uh, it has to think about what it has done. Uh, it has to realize that even if at the time it might make sense, delegating legislative authority without the ability to re retain a meaningful check uh, is unacceptable. Um, one possibility is to do what Erica mentioned, to go what's known as the two house approval in which the president declares an emergency, but both houses have to continue that. The article one piece of legislation that she mentioned is a step in the right direction. President certainly gonna veto that. And I would doubt that the Senate uh, in particular is gonna show enough backbone to overturn that veto. Another possibility is to at least require uh, notification requirements, as Jennifer Daskal pointed out in a lawfare piece. At least make the president justify, come before Congress and explain why he's doing it. What is the justifications? As we saw with the Soleimani uh, uh, attack, when the president is forced to justify something, right? the original claim was that there was a threat of, of imminent uh, attack on American in assets, but then the actual justification, no, that's not there. The, 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 the justification falls apart or even just a sense of Congress, right? Just symbolic resolutions. But right now what we have is really nothing. The only thing that Congress can do is pass laws that will be vetoed by the president. And that I think is an unacceptable um, uh, situation that really opens up the possibility of abuse of power and things that will affect uh, the most vulnerable among us. And so until we get uh, a Congress that's willing to stand up for itself and until we get a president who is willing to maybe not veto a piece of legislation, there's not much that I think that can be done uh, and we're in a really problematic situation. And I, again, I put a lot of that blame on Congress for doing this in the first place. So uh, I'll stop there and hand things back to, to Angie, who's gonna then introduce our next speaker. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Seth. Um, I took vigorous notes during your presentation. I'm looking forward to returning to you and Erica with some follow-up questions. Sure, of course. So, yeah, no, thank you. Um, that was a great presentation. So next up is Laura. So let me introduce you to Laura. 
She is the pro bono counsel at the American Bar Association's Commission on Immigration. Prior to this position, she served as a visiting attorney with the Texas Civil Rights Project, managing the family reunification efforts and fighting against zero tolerance policies along the US-Mexico border. As a native of the Rio Grande Valley, Laura joined an organization to help those most vulnerable families being targeted by extreme law enforcement policies. She was previously appointed as a foreign policy advisor at the US State Department under the Obama administration, and then later served as an immigration trial attorney at the US Department of Homeland Security. Laura has also worked in private practice, managing corporate business immigration strategies for technology companies in Silicon Valley. Um, her presentation is going to be slightly different than our first two speakers uh, because it's going to be more focused on what's actually happening at the border and some of the recent policies that have impacted that reality. Welcome, Laura. Thank you, Angie. Uh, before jumping into the issue of asylum, I, I just wanted to say as a border resident um, and living in an area of the border, which is the southernmost uh, tip of Texas, you know, the wall that has been has already been constructed from previous funding, I would just note from a from a personal perspective, uh, it is harmful. It is harmful to our communities. It separates communities that have a long history of interconnectivity. Um, it also is harmful to the environment. Uh, we have a number of preservations, reserved areas uh, that protect the wildlife, uh, bird life, if you're a birder. Uh, and love birds. The Rio Grande Valley is rich in a wide variety of birds, and there are a number of areas that are preserved specifically to ensure that this type of wildlife is protected. And any additional construction of border wall does threaten our threatens our environment and also uh, separates our communities. Um, from the perspective of the ABA, I wanted to talk about the physical border wall aside. Uh, what the administration has done is creative, created an extremely effective uh, virtual wall of policies that has effectively uh, nearly eliminated asylum for individuals, for, 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 for refugees who are seeking protection uh, from the United States. Uh, I, I thought it might be helpful to just give a brief overview of what asylum is for those uh, who don't probably most folks here don't practice immigration law, so I'll just give a, a brief overview of what asylum is, and then I'm going to go through specific policies that have been implemented to dismantle the availability of asylum for individuals seeking protection. The concept of refugee protection began after World War I, when millions of people fled their homelands looking for safety elsewhere. The focus was initially on governments coming together to reach agreements and provide travel documentation that would really facilitate the movement of individuals and protection for those in need. This was led by the League of Nations. The numbers increased dramatically after the atrocities of World War II when millions more were forcibly displaced or deported and needed resettlement. The international community came together more formally after World War II to create specific instruments defining who qualifies as a refugee and the kinds of legal protections and social services the refugees are entitled to receive. Now, the two main instruments that resulted from this process were the 1951 Convention relating to the status of refugees, which was later amendment, amended by the 1967 Protocol to expand the scope of the convention from World War II European refugees to others facing displacement around the world. Now, the basic concept uh, is, it's called non-refoulement, non-refoulement or non-refoulement. It's a rule of customary international law that provides that a refugee cannot be returned to a territory where his or her life or freedom is threatened. All right, it's a very basic premise of our international legal obligations is that we cannot turn uh, people to, pla to places where they may be harmed or where their freedom is threatened. The U.S. is a signatory to the 1967 protocol only, but it's also undertaken most obligations of the convention as the supreme law of the land. The U.S. later went on to codify refugee protection in the Refugee Act of 1980, 
significant amendments to the application procedures and some eligibility requirements were made in the last uh, major immigration reform, which was in 1996. Now the basic US definition of a refugee is someone who is outside of their country of nationality and unable or unwilling to return and who has a well-founded fear of persecution on account of five fact, one of five factors, race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. This last uh, category is the most flexible and has also come under attack under the current administration. The feared persecutor must be a state actor or an entity that the home government cannot or will not control. Now, the only difference between eligibility for refugee status, which I just defined what a refugee is, and eligibility for asylum is the place of application. So refugee status is adjudicated abroad, but applications for asylum are made when the applicant is either, either at the border, which I'm going to discuss, or already within the interior of the US. The current statute also includes a number of bars to asylum, which includes some criminal offenses, terrorism, national security grounds, or failure to apply within one year of arrival to the United States. So that's a very quick and dirty overview of asylum. But now, since uh, we are all asylum experts, I'm going to go into and jump into the, the attacks on asylum that we're seeing specifically here on, on the border. And I'm going to try and describe it in, in a way so you can sort of visualize and understand what it means, um, uh, both for the individuals who are seeking protection, but also for the individuals who are, are trying to render legal services, uh, such as myself and other attorneys who may be interested in figuring out how they can help specifically on the border with a number of these cases. So one of the first attacks came in the form of a policy called metering. Since early on in the administration, the Department of Homeland Security began uh, piloting uh, this, this program. And what it is, is, okay, hopefully some folks uh, on this webinar have actually traveled to Canada or to Mexico, but to enter those countries, you've walked across, all right? So in order to uh, enter that country, it, you, it may be a bridge, it may be a land crossing, but to enter that country, you typically there's a turnstile, you pay a little money and you walk into, uh, let's just say you're going to Mexico and you're inspected by Mexican authorities. On your way back to the United States, you're gonna, you, you're going to require the, you know, you're also gonna be required to be inspected by US officials once you return to the United States. Now in that process, whether you're going to Mexico or coming back to the United States, that midway point, that's the international boundary line. What metering did was um, instead of being inspected officially, once you have presented in the United States, so you're returning from Mexico, you present in the United States, what it looks like today is Customs and Border Protection armed officials uh, with riot gear um, that's next to them, uh, barbed wires, uh, they are armed with pistols. They stand at the midway point of the bridge. They stand at the midway point of the bridge and the only the people, the only individuals who can pass that midway point, that international boundary line, are people who have the appropriate documentation to enter the United States. That means you either have to have, be a US citizen, a lawful permanent resident, or if you're a non-citizen, then you have to have a valid travel document, a, a valid document to enter the United States. What this has done is it's effectively pushed people back and prevented them from even uh, allowing the opportunity to ask for asylum. I spent nine hours on the bridge two weeks ago with, with a family that I was trying to uh, get reunified. Uh, the father is in the United States. He's won asylum. He's an asylee in the United States. And his wife and child are stuck in the Remain in Mexico program. And so I was on the bridge trying to facilitate that reunification. But in that process, there were ten, about 10 families patiently sitting on that bridge for the same nine hours as I was. And these CBP agents who are at that midway point are telling them, we're full, 
We don't have capacity to allow you to come seek asylum. Put your name on the list. All right. So these individuals who have fled from various countries have to figure out who in Mexico, sometimes it's the Mexican government, sometimes it's nonprofits, manage a list. They put their names on a list and they wait. They wait until the United States government has capacity in order to accept them for processing for asylum. That is metering. That is sending individuals back to places where they are going to be harmed uh, because these border towns in particular are extremely dangerous. Where I live, the, the state is called Tamaulipas. It is this, uh, the State Department has uh, classified the state of Tamaulipas as a level four danger security zone, which is the same as Syria and Afghanistan. We are in violation just with this first policy of our inter international obligations. So, okay, let's, let's, let's say that you're an asylum seeker, you've been turned away, you put your name on your list, you're, you're waiting, you want to do this the right way, you wait three months, your name gets called somehow, and uh, the CBP agent says, okay, we are going to process you. You are now, depending on your country of origin, uh, if you are from a Spanish-speaking country or Brazil, uh, uh, for, well, things have changed a little bit, but let's just say for the for the next policy that I'm going to talk about is remain in Mexico. And so individuals from um, non-Mexican individuals from Spanish speaking countries and Brazil, uh, they are sent back to Mexico for the pendency of their immigration proceedings. And so this, if you are that asylum seeker, you've waited for months in Mexico, maybe in a shelter, uh, maybe you've been able to cobble together some money to uh, share, a, a, you know, a small apartment with other families who are waiting. Um, you're sent back to Mexico and you are uh, issued what's called a notice to appear. It's a charging document in immigration proceedings. Um, I'm cognizant of time and it's already 2.50. So I'm, I'm going to kind of go through Remain in Mexico, but a quick overview over is um, over 55,000 people have been returned to Mexico to await their proceedings, which includes at least 16,000 children and 500 babies. Vulnerable groups such as individuals with disabilities, indigenous speakers, LGBTQ. I was just in Matamoros earlier today and I was interviewing a five people, five separate cases of victims of human trafficking. Okay, so these are incredibly vulnerable groups who are being sent back to Mexico. Um, where I am based, I'm with the ABA Commission on Immigration, I'm pro bono counsel, but I am based at ProBar, which is located in Harlingen, Texas. It's the ABA's largest um, asylum project. Now, in this specific area, in Matamoros, which is the 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 um, the Mexican city closest closest to where we are located, nearly 2,000 asylum seekers are now in a refugee camp, which is very close to the U.S. port of entry. Uh, I just saw on my feed earlier today a family that that took their vacation here to the border to volunteer. Uh, they wrote an article and it just came out in Bloomberg about their experience and what they saw at this border refugee camp. This refugee camp that has been created as a result of US policies. I wanna tell you a little bit about what I've witnessed with my own eyes, and then I'm gonna talk about how you can help because I don't think I have enough time to go through all of the other policies. Uh, but if you have specific questions, we can leave that for the Q&A. This is what I have witnessed. I have witnessed women traumatized by kidnappings and, and rape. Children developmentally delayed due to the trauma of their journey and continued insecurity in Mexico. I've seen children subjected to abuse by adult male predators in the refugee camp. I've seen a lack of meaningful access to counsel. Only 4% of individuals in Remain in Mexico a program have attorneys. Contrast that with 32% of individuals who are allowed to seek asylum or other forms of relief in the US. I've seen grown men cry due to fear of second kidnapping and extortion. A Human Rights First has an excellent website where they are they're monitoring the kidnappings and extortions and, and, and even murders of individuals who are sent back to remain in Mexico. Over 800 in, um, documented incidents of crime and violence 
uh, have been um, reported by the NGOs. I've also witnessed outbreaks of chicken pox among children, severe hunger, dehydration, lack of access to clean water, homelessness, and a whole new level of family separations, which are a direct result of new policies that this, this administration has, has, has implemented. Now, how you can help, um, there is a letter uh, that I address to civil rights attorneys in terms of how, if you want to get involved in the border, what you can do. I've provided specific links and specific advice. And with that, I think I'm gonna have to turn it over to NG. Thank you, Laura. Um, so just a reminder to our audience members, you do have an opportunity to pose questions. We are going to start our Q&A session. So I'm gonna ask all the panelists to resume their places um, on the panel. And if the audience has any Q&As, use your control panel to pose those questions. Um, Laura, I do want to start with you and just give you a few more minutes to provide some uh, specific information to those people who may be interested in volunteering um, or otherwise giving some guidance about how they can, members of the legal profession, how can we actually respond to some of the regressive policies that you've outlined for us in a short time um, that you've spoken? Sure, sure. Um, so my, uh, I will also, and I'll circulate, we're going to have a second webinar that's going to go more into detail about how attorneys can volunteer their time on the border. That will be on February 27th. But in general, I would, I would encourage anybody listening here to not look for a perfect case. Just look for the right partner. There's several border or initiatives that are looking for pro bono partners. Even if you're a solo practitioner, there are organizations that can use your help. Uh, my letter has a list of recent border, of, a list of border organizations that you can reach out to. And if they don't respond, don't give up. We're just so overwhelmed here on the border, but we definitely need your help. I'd also um, recommend that you look to your local bar associations for connections to the border. One example is an immigration attorney in Austin did a CLE with her with the Austin uh, local bar, and she's training lawyers um, in, in terms of how to go about volunteering for cases in their specific communities. So I'd encourage you to look locally as well. I'd also say don't expect it to be tidy or neat. Immigration law is quite complicated, but don't let that intimidate you. Um, just be prepared to take time and to take time to invest actually in yourself, investing in your own capacity, your own knowledge, your own learning of this area of the law will yield so much more in the future. So I would encourage it, you know, don't be shy in investing time in yourself to be able to learn the law. That way you can lend your support to these cases. I would also say come to the border, but come to the border with a commitment in mind, whether that's for humanitarian work or for legal work. And some of the, the links that I, I give uh, in my letter, you can go ahead and reference those. As well as, of course, with the ABA Commission on Immigration, there's a link. Uh, if you sign up on that link, you'll get emails from us uh, with other volunteer opportunities. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Laura. That was incredibly helpful. Um, I know that your presentation focused uh, exclusively sort of on the effects of the border on local communities, um, as well as related policies and, and those effects on, on vulnerable communities. I'd like to turn next to Seth um, and then after that to both Erica and Seth with some related questions. But, you know, Seth, you, uh, you, you mentioned in your presentation the fact that you believe that President Trump in, uh, acted pursuant to congressional, congressional, congressional statutory authority when he in fact declared the public emergency um, by virtue of the fact that he is vested with this authority in the National Emergencies Act. Um, and I understand that position, but I wonder how you reconcile it with allegations of pretext. The fact that, in his own words, he did not, in fact, have to declare the public emergency at all. And rather, it seemed like uh, an issue of expediency, uh, perhaps one of retaliation um, to sort of assert his authority uh, because of the fact that Congress refused to appropriate the money that he specifically asked for. So how do you reconcile that? Well, first, 
I don't doubt that in fact everything that is correct, right? I don't doubt that that there isn't that he does that it is a pretext. I don't doubt that this was uh, uh, an action taken because he the president was unable to get the money uh, from Congress. I don't doubt any of that. Uh, but you know we also have to deal with the reality of politics. And I, and so I would say there's a couple of things that make me basically argue that yes, it is with uh, um, president is acting uh, pursuant to legislative authority. So the first is that you know while I think sort of it, it certainly makes sense to take into context all these different things that he said. There's also there is some danger about this, right? Which is that presidents say all kinds of things. They make promises to people. Politicians make promises to people. Some of them they might mean. Some of them they don't mean. You know, we in political science we refer to this as cheap talk. You can say things. You know, you can lie and you can say things. But until the rubber meets the road, those things don't really matter. So, for example, there, right during the lawsuits over the travel ban, there were claims that you know the evidence that the travel bans were motivated by racial animus were in the statements that he said. And I think the court, you know, things that, that he had tweeted out. And I think the court, and I think rightly said, you know, we can't get in the business of trying to parse everything that presidents have said and trying to figure out their motives. All we can do is look and see whether or not they are complying with the law. Right. Um, and again, I'm not saying those decisions were correct. I'm just saying that in this specific, I, I think that it, it, it becomes problematic to try to figure out which things that presidents say um, we should listen to and which things presidents say we shouldn't listen to. Now, again, I, it, I you know, the reality is I think you're exactly right, but that, that the problem none, nonetheless exists. So, um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that um, you know, we see repeatedly that when Congress fails to do the proper kind of restraint or put sunset clauses in or things like this, you know, this allows presidents to make what they will of it. And, you know, the way that the process works until Congress can override vetoes, they don't really have many options. So I'll just put us in, in a slightly different context. If you look at the authorization for the use of military force from 2001, the one that that uh, was the one that authorized essentially the invasion of Afghanistan and allowed the president to take military action against Al Qaeda, right? President Obama used that in to go into Syria, uh, you know, and uh, used it to justify the operations against ISIS. Was ISIS covered under the 2001 AUMF? Absolutely not, but the language of the AUMF basically says the president gets to determine who was responsible and involved in September 11th. And if you write that, then you can't then complain when the president makes a determination you don't like, and there's nothing that really can be done about it. In, in theory, I guess, unless they can overcome the bar uh, of the veto, right, and figure out a way to block the president's actions, right? So that AUMF is still being used to justify um, military operations in Somalia, all over the world, even though I think these things are clearly beyond the original intent and purpose of the AUMF, right? So I, I guess the reason I gave that answer is because politically that is the outcome that we are at now, which is that the president is using a piece of legislation that Congress passed, did, could not figure out how to properly, you know, it would have been great if they had put, uh, as Erica mentioned, that two house approval, when when they had to pull the legislative veto out, if they had been more aware, been thinking a little bit better, they could have figured out that this is a really dangerous thing we're doing, but they didn't do it. And so now, you know, I guess, I, I mean, so again, I think my sense is that in re sort of, again, it's like the Schrodinger's emergency thing. While I, while I completely agree that this is a pretextualized, that, that, that this is a, a fake emergency uh, and that it was a response to the failure to, you know, get the desired outcome through the proper process, the, the political reality is that doesn't matter, right? The matter is that there is a legally declared emergency that then activates certain powers. And that is, that is a, again, there are specific questions that Erica pointed out that even if the emergency is properly declared, then that still doesn't necessarily mean you can take all these monies from these different places, right? That's a separate legal question. But the legal aspect of it, I think that we are essentially in that, uh, that category of pursuant to congressional authorization. Okay, so um, so Erica, I want to turn to you. I mean, I think Seth is a political scientist, and so he provides us with a valuable perspective um, from that standpoint. From a legal perspective, it seems to me that pretext is key in terms of understanding whether or not 
the executive is in fact in compliance with the law, right? Particularly given the litigation that both your organization and the ACLU are pursuing. Um, so I do wanna give you an opportunity to, to respond and also share your perspective as well. So you know, it's, it Seth's, uh, and Seth's point about the Supreme Court decision in the travel ban case, which I disagree with, but which is a Supreme Court decision, um, is, is well taken, that it, uh, the court, at least there, was not looking at the president's statements. I think that what is happening with this, uh, with this particular proclamation, it's different. It's even, you know, line drawing can be difficult, of course. This is a place that is so clearly over the line. I don't think you need to, um, kind of debate exactly where that line should be drawn. It's the president himself who who's saying these things. It's not a surrogate, a campaign surrogate. It's when he's president, not when he's campaigning. So you don't have the kind of poop, the kind of poopery of, of or puffery, excuse me, of a campaign speak. Um, it said in the Rose Garden as he is announcing um, the proclamation itself. So it's contemporaneous. It is, there's no debate that it's about the proclamation. And in fact, it was threatened before, before he issued the proclamation. So, you know, during the entire process of crafting that proclamation and then upon issuance, he was saying there is no actual emergency here. I also think, you know, for those who are thinking on more of a legal theory level, um, you know, the president and his Department of Justice ascribe to a kind of unitary executive view, and they um, they base that. Um, it's not one I ascribe to, but but they base the legitimacy for that and the idea that the president is uniquely accountable to the American people. They can vote him out. Um, but part of accountability is um, responsibility for what you say to the American people, who are who are the voters. And so there's a there's quite the tension there between saying that his unique accountability justifies extraordinary powers, but it but that he is also shielded from um, being held accountable in courts of law for what he is saying to uh, to those American voters. So I don't think it holds up as a matter of kind of. Uh, of theory um, or of um, or of lo where the law should be while recognizing that the travel ban case does um, does offer a little put a little bit of a wrench in that though I think it's it's very much distinguishable. Okay, thank you for that, Erica. Um, my next question goes to to both Seth and Erica, um, and it speaks to the issue of partisanship. I mean, we've seen that immigration policy uh, in recent years, if not longer, has really been ideologically driven. Um, according to the public opinion polling, uh, it's clear that Republicans favor regressive immigration policy, whereas Democrats um, are seem much more welcoming of immigrant populations. Specifically, for example, according to a public opinion survey from the Public Religion Research Institute, uh, about 60, 63% of Republicans favor a barrier wall along the border, whereas approximately 70% of Democrats oppose such a barrier wall. Um, and yet what's interesting is that in relation to the declaration of uh, a national emergency, we have seen bipartisan support for resolutions to terminate, right? There's significant, I would say, um, I'm not sure if you would agree or disagree, but there's significant support from Republicans in the House and uh, the Senate to to terminate the public emergency. We've seen this twice. How do we grapple with this? How do we grapple with the fact that Republicans are overwhelmingly in support of the barrier wall, right? The president's position to actually build a wall along the border with Mexico, um, and yet are opposed to the declaration of a public emergency. Is it because it constitutes a threat to their own authority um, and has deeper implications for democracy? Or again, how do we, how do we reconcile sort of this divergence? Eric, do you want to go first, Erica? Do you want me to go first? Oh, um, why don't you go first? This is one I struggle with. Sure. Uh, so I would answer. I would answer two things. I would say first that yes, there is some sense of a threat to institutional authority. Uh, you know, organizational theory. Organizations have their own interests. They want to retain their power. You know that certainly when the president is usurping uh, legislative power that threatens uh, Congress's ability to legislate. So I would say there's certainly some of that. And I, I guess I'm gonna kind of echo my, my point from the last comment and take it in a different comment. You know, I would say you, you have to be careful with looking at votes that don't actually get to the, to the threshold because people who might not vote, so if you can imagine, right, the, the process of whipping votes in the House is, is really, really a complicated one. 
right? So Congress people, both representatives and senators, might feel that they want to vote one way, but that their political dynamic forces them to vote in another way, right? So, you know, I don't, I, you know, my constituency wants this, but I as a person don't want this. And the job of the, the, the party whips in each house is to figure out how many people do we need and who can vote against something, right? So just because someone votes, a, just, to, just because a senator, for example, or a congressperson votes to override a veto, unless there were enough votes to actually override the veto, you don't know what they would actually do in the case that they would actually override it, right? I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm explaining this properly, but the fact that they're not going to get to two thirds means that more senators, more Congress people can actually vote for the vo vote, knowing it's not going to pass, right? To try to set, to try to signal if you're a moderate, for example, if you're a moderate Republican and you don't want to alienate your moderate voters, hey, I stood up to the president, but that vote actually has no effect so it's okay to vote against the president, but if your vote actually would contribute to getting over the two thirds threshold, then maybe you wouldn't vote, right? So you have to be a little bit careful. You, I mean, it, yes, there does seem to be some evidence that you know there is a more bipartisan um, opposition to this kind of usurpation. I'm not convinced it's actually as strong as it looks like on paper, um, just politically in terms of the ways that the votes work, so. Interesting, Erica? I, I largely agree with Seth. I hope I'm being too cynical, but um, <laughs> but I fear I'm not. I, For the I, scientists, we can't be too cynical. So <laughs> I will I will simply add that um, you know I do think this is one place where people are still able to see that you know what is good for the goose is good for the gander or bad for the goose is bad for the gander that seems very rare these days um i think it's a it's a fundamental kind of precept of rule of law um and so i am heartened to see some some recognition by folks on the hill that you know if they let uh let trump do it then you know what goes around um could could come around on them yeah i mean i i do agree with that i i'd like to be a little bit more optimistic than i am um we'll see um, so one last question before we wrap up, and again, this is for uh, Erica and Seth. You know, Seth, during your presentation, I was struck by some of the numbers that you provided. I think at one point, if I wrote correctly, you said that in the context of declarations of national emergencies, that Congress should have engaged in 1,100 reviews, yep. um, but in reality, only did so two to three times, right, yep. since um, the 1970s when yep. this act was uh, originally yeah. came into into effect um and yet we are seeing them you know i, I think their their uh the, the resolutions to terminate are noteworthy um and and clearly examples of them reasserting themselves um and and perhaps taking back some power is that is that a fair assessment to say that this is perhaps a step towards the restoration of a separation of of powers um, that was being undermined, either you know, perhaps uh, inadvertently over the years by virtue of the fact that they were sort of delegating their authority, um, or what is your you know larger interpretation in terms of the legacy of these actions? You know, this this carries precedential value. I mean, what what does this mean for us as a country um, in terms of politics and government? And again, well, it's I, both of you. Yeah, I, I hope it's a sign that they've realized they've gone too far, but I'm not so sure. I mean, the problem, I think, is that we've become increasingly polarized as a country. Congress mm -hmm. has become increasingly sclerotic. Um, and so, I mean, I, this sort of represents an extreme example that I think has produced some pushback. But, you know, I think both parties sort of realize that if you want to govern, you know, you just have to do it by executive fiat. Um, and you know that you're just not going to get the kinds, you know, the, the kinds of majorities and the kinds of bipartisanship in particular that we used to have. I'm not an American. I don't study American politics, so uh, you know, I hope I'm not uh, too sort of far afield here. Um, I mean, I think that in this case, um, you know, it really, I think it comes down more to uh, legislative sort of prerogative and the sense of the the, the of Congress. That they are losing control of the ability to legislate, um, you know whether or not that leads them to sort of rethink all these various things that they've done. Again, the AUMF, you know, so they just they, you know, the AUMF has no sunset in it. There's nothing they can do to get that power back. Um, and so, as we've seen, right, it just keeps getting turned against different actors, right? The the Real ID Act thing, uh, 
that I mentioned that allows the president to override, you know, all those things that Laura was talking about, all the things that are happening. These are all things that should be protected by laws. And the president can just waive them because Congress said you can waive anything you want to. Um, and, you know, I, I think it, what we Congress just, um, I think, has failed us in, in a lot of these ways. And I mean, I think also there is some responsibility on us. You know, we can't like it when our president does it. And, you know, we can't like it when our president rules by executive orders and 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 does constitutionally un, un problematic things. We have to stick to the, pr the framework that the that the Constitution sets up because opening that door, I think, gets problematic. So the door has been opened. Congress opened it. We sat back and sort of let it happen. And now we've got this person who is an inveterate liar who I think I'm willing to say, I don't think, I don't, I, it's probably the first president, maybe since Nick, right, certainly since Nixon, who I think doesn't act in, in what that person believes to be the best interest of the country and has no respect for precedent or the, or the norms of governance. And this is what happens now. And so, I mean, I hope that you're right. Um, I hope that this is the beginning of Congress trying to figure out ways to claw some of that power back. I hope that whoever is the next president following Trump um, is a president who's willing to allow Congress to pull those powers back and maybe not veto, you know, that uh, the Article One Act and 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 change some of this stuff. But that's a hard thing to ask any president to do to give up the ability to govern and do the things you want to do. So I hope that it's that there's time to close the, the, the door before the you know, before the cows or horses. I can't remember what the analogy with the with the story, right? but before the barn door gets uh, close the barn door. But I don't know that that's possible. You know, is the next president going to be willing to to not veto these things and allow Congress to take that back? We'll see. I don't know. Um, I'm not hopeful. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a valuable message about what's good for your president is going to be good for my president. Um, and, and, you know, an important lesson for us, I think, to keep in mind going forward. And I think it's also important that you stress the character of the president. I know that there are commentators that have um, that have quipped that, you know, the Congress gave this much power to the president in the National Emergencies Act because they assumed that the president would always exercise self-restraint. Yeah, right, and the, right. The Republic, um, and unfortunately, we're confronted with a president that has absolutely no self-restraint, whether it's in you know the context of social media or declaring public emergencies. Um, Erica, I want to give you an opportunity to to share your perspective as well. Yeah. Um. So let me push back just a little bit about what that point you just made, Angie, and then um and then I'll get to to Seth's point a little bit. You know, when the National Emergencies Act and the War Powers Act were passed, this was right after Vietnam, it's right after Nixon. Um, there was, I think, an understanding that presidents could act um, in, could abuse their power, whether good faith or not, could, be, could very much abuse their power and act in, in quasi-autocratic ways. What I think, I think the legislative history behind those acts has kind of become, been twisted over the years as those acts have been taken, reinterpreted from constraints on, um, on executive authority to, to broad authorizations and empowerment. That's not to say you were twisting it. It's just to say that's what the, that you're, you've absolutely captured what the narrative has become. And I think that's a sign of how the kind of folks who um, are very pro-executive authority have have really succeeded in, in redefining the narrative of these laws and therefore making them more powerful than they were ever intended to be. Um, as for Congress's capacity to govern, um, there are some things that are really hard to fix about Congress and there are some things that are easier to fix about Congress. Um, partisanship in this country, that's above my pay grade. But, um, uh, but you know what I can say is that when I spent some time on the Hill, there were two or three legislative staffers, maximum of three, extremely smart, extremely hardworking, like extremely good people working um, working on legislation that the entire executive intelligence bureaucracy was weigh, was weighing in on. This is the USA Freedom Act. Um, uh, so some Patriot Act provisions. There was no way that as, as wonderful as these individuals were, they were gonna be able to take in all of the information that was necessary in order to, um, in order to legislate independently from what the executive branch wanted. And um, so things like better staffing for Congress, um, more space for Congress, um, uh, better better resources for Congress to rely on. All of these are things that can promote the type of governance that we want and help give members of Congress and their staff more comfort and confidence in their ability to legislate intelligently. It doesn't mean they will, it's maybe not sufficient, but I think it's a necessary condition. 
Good. Um, so in wrapping up, I want to give each of you just a few moments to share any concluding thoughts, insights that you might have before we adjourn the program. So Laura, let's begin with you. Sure. Thank you. I just want to thank, honestly, the panelists. It was very, very interesting to learn from you. And again, as a border resident, uh, the declaration of you know, a national emergency here on the border when it's most of these border places, at least on the U.S. side, are safe places. And so I would encourage those who have listened uh, to the fascinating legal and policy and political issues along the border wall. If you're interested, visit the border. Um, come see the environment that we have here. We have, like I said, it's a big birding destination, uh, but there are also a lot of people in need. And the remaining Mexico pro group broke the entire population uh, to be forced to be in very dire circumstances. Uh, so I'd encourage you to read the letter uh, that if it hasn't been issued, will be issued and I uh, appreciate your support. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Laura. Seth, any concluding thoughts? Sure. I mean, as, as someone who teaches, you know, uh, politics and teaches, uh, you know, students who are hopefully going to go out and, and uh, work to fix some of the problems that that we have uh, i mean i would say it's incumbent on all of us to to be aware of the things that our government is doing right i mean we can't go back in time and pay attention to the uses of the national emergency act right but we need to um we need to push back when congress uh is letting these things go unnoticed and we need to be more aware of the purpose of government and the structural processes that the founders created and what they were there to do. Uh, you know, it's sort of, I, th I think one of the, if there's sort of a, a silver lining of the Trump administration, it's that I think we're going to realize how much of what we took for granted as to how this country operates was in fact simply precedent. Right, was not written into law and was simply that presidents behaved in certain ways and took things with a certain kind of gravitas or whatever. And the, and now that's, you know, that all depends on the willingness of a president to behave in that way. And so I think as citizens, you know, it's our responsibility to, to know, to notice when uh, presidents uh, are using their powers in ways that are not consonant with our governing principles, with our governing structures, with our governing documents, um, and uh, to keep that in mind, and to you know, and to you know, write our Congress people and and do those things, and and let them know that we're aware of what's happening, and that we want change. And that's you know, that's that that's small, but in theory, at least in this country, that's the way it's supposed to work. And so I think we have to do that. We can't just sit back. Uh, and let this stuff happen because when it gets too late, then it's too late. Wonderful, thank you. Such important advice and reminders. Um, Erica, let's conclude with you. you know, one thing that uh, folks in my organization spend a lot of time talking about is how to make sure that law still matters. And there are some communities in this country for whom law has never mattered as much as it should. Um, I don't wanna sound like we, we lived in an idyllic past. But um, one thing we're thinking about with this uh, national emergency um, litigation and then the reform efforts is making sure that, um, that our laws still matter because that's the core of uh, what the ABA is, is about and what we rely on to, I think, have a safe and um, healthy society. Wonderful. Thank you for that powerful message, Erica. I want to take a moment to thank each of our panelists again for actually sharing their time and resources. Um, we really value their expertise and perspectives and we're better for it. I also want to thank all of our audience for joining us for this webinar. As you know, this is part of our six part national lecture series. Our next webinar, Do We Treat America's Wartime Detainees Better Than Migrant Children, is scheduled for Wednesday, March 18th at 2.30 p.m. and we look forward to having you then. Until then, stay safe. Thank you Thank so you much. much. Thank yeah. you.